cancel all the plans you have for tomorrow because Saudi Arabia is about to take over the world. Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is creating something so futuristic that once it's finished, it could make him the most powerful man in the entire world. Salman is pioneering the Earth's first ever sci-fi city called Neom. And the clue is in the name. Neom combines two words. The Greek word Neo, which means new, and the Arabic word Maktakbol, which means future. In other words, the Prime Minister Salman is creating a new future for Saudi Arabia. A new world, a real life metaverse that no one will ignore. And when you see Neom's master plan, you will not know whether to be terrified or excited. So, without further ado, allow me to introduce you to the sci-fi structure that has broke the internet. Saudi Arabia's goal is to build a country within a country called The Line, a 105 mile linear city that will cut through the Arabian desert. But take a look at this. If the Crown Prince pulls this off, the line will actually be the largest building ever built. It will be the equivalent to having 2,000 Empire State Buildings in two lines running for 170 kilometers. It's almost as if Salman is trying to create a hyper object that is even more perplexing than the pyramids of Giza. Okay, let's ask the obvious question here. What will life look like for these 9 million residents? Well, you haven't seen anything yet. Leaked documents reveal that the line will have robotic servants, an artificial moon, dinosaur robots, and flying taxis that look like they came straight out of a movie like Fifth Element. However, what is public knowledge is that Neom is going to design a portal that will transport a person from the physical to the digital. The schools are actually going to have holographic teachers and traveling will be super efficient. Everything that a person could ever need will be within a five minute walk. And if for any reason you do want to leave, well, you can travel from end to end in 20 minutes using zero carbon emission. Under normal circumstances, a project of this scale would take 80 years to build. For instance, the Three Gorges Dam took 17 years to complete and that was with a team of 40,000 workers. But Saudi Arabia insists that they will complete the line by 2030. And if you thought all of this was just a publicity stunt, well check out this drone footage. This isn't just a sci-fi movie anymore. Saudi Arabia has already completed 20% of the infrastructure and they are serious about turning this dream into a reality. But listen to me. When I first began my research into Neom, I severely underestimated just how staggering this project really is. And when you see this, you've got to admit to me that if the Crown Prince pulls this off, he truly could become one of the most formidable men in the entire world. May I go deeper? Just like Paris hosts the iconic Eiffel Tower, London hosts Big Ben, and New York hosts the Statue of Liberty, Saudi Arabia wants its own icon, its own national symbol that will draw millions of tourists to its capital in Rijar. And here is the proposed icon. It's called the Maqab, or also known as the Cube. This cube will be 400 meters high and 400 meters wide. It will be big enough to contain 20 Empire State Buildings and the roof itself is very impressive. At the very top of the structure will be a giant sized lake which will hold billions and billions of litres of water. The cube is unlike anything you've ever seen. Everyone who enters will be transported into a different world. Whether you want to go to the bottom of the ocean or to the surface of Mars, the cube's immersive VR can transport you wherever your imagination wants to go. But first, don't tell me that Saudi Arabia's next project isn't mind-blowing. Meet Trajina. Let's go back in time and let's ask your grandparents if they could ever imagine a winter games being held in the Saudi Arabian desert. What would they say? I think they'd call you crazy and so would I until I saw this. 
In October 2022, Saudi Arabia signed an agreement to be the chosen host for the 2029 Winter Games. And in just three years, they claim they will turn this arid desert into a luxurious ski resort. They'll be using 100% artificial snow for obvious reasons, and they are also going to create a winter village called the Vault, sandwiched between two mountains. Are you imagining this right now? The stakes are so high and this deadline is non-negotiable. So Saudi Arabia have put 500 billion behind this project to ensure that it will be completed. And again, just consider how much prestige, how much fame this will bring to the country if the Crown Prince's plans come into fruition. I wonder if I should share this with you, but I am curious to know, did Saudi Arabia choose particular symbols in their designs of the neon projects? For instance, we've got the line, we've got the cube, we've got Trajina, which is an interesting shape, and then one I haven't shown you yet is Neom's luxury island, Sindala. And I know I've got an overactive imagination, but it kind of looks like a sea creature to me, like a leviathan with sharp teeth and even a cord coming out of its nose. And then another project which Prime Minister Salman is donating his wealth to is definitely meant to look like a sea creature. Pangaeus, named after Pangaea the supercontinent, is going to become the world's largest yacht and the first itinerant floating city which will accommodate 60,000 people on this $8 billion turtle. And some of you are already aware of Neom's other project, Oxygen, which, let's be honest, the clue's in the name. It's no surprise what shape this is. And this is Saudi Arabia's plan for an industrial floating city. So what am I saying? Effectively, I'm wondering, is there a hidden narrative? Is there a story that weaves all of the projects together in Neom and we've just never been told about it? yet. So, over to you. What do you think about Neon? Do you think that it's a groundbreaking new world? Or do you think it's a holographic nightmare? Well, Saudi Arabia has certainly received its lion's share of criticism for Neon. The most immediate question is, where will Saudi Arabia get the money to finance all of these projects? Because did you know, all of them combined will come to a total of one trillion dollars. And it's no secret that Salman's plan is to put his country back on the map as a wealthy superpower by diversifying their economy away from oil and into tourism and technology. But will Saudi's public investment fund garner enough investors to fund such an ambitious project? Another controversial question that does need to be asked is will Saudi Arabia complete all of these projects in time? As I said earlier, some of these structures are predicted to take as long as 80 years to build. And yet what is the deadline that Saudi Arabia has set for itself with all of these ambitious proposals? 2030. Because Neom's tagline is the 2030 vision. And Trojina, those winter games, have been promised to be completed as early as 2026. Now, without being too sceptical, this isn't the first time that Saudi Arabia has not fulfilled its assignment date. Back in 2013, it began construction on the world's largest skyscraper called the Kingdom Tower. What an interesting name. We'll come back to that later. But this proposed ginormous skyscraper, now named the Jeddah Tower, was supposed to be completed in 2018, but was suddenly ceased due to unforeseen circumstances. It even garnered the interest and backing of financial investors like Bill Gates. But now, this tower has a very uncertain future. Guys, I might be way off on this one, but personally, I actually do believe that the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman will achieve his plans for Neon. And I believe that the whole world will be stunned, will be shocked, and will look out at Saudi Arabia and be amazed that they completed all of this, all of this technology in the space of just a few years. But I actually find one of Salman's goals a little concerning. Part of Neom's project is they plan to build a causeway from Saudi Arabia to Egypt, which will connect Africa's continent to the Middle East by bypassing Israel. 
Now on the surface, this might seem like a revolutionary idea, but the Bible predicted such a coalition, where all the nations of the world will join together in unity and they will march to Israel in an attempt to take God's people out. And again, perhaps I'm just reaching here, again perhaps I'm just using my overactive imagination, but this causeway potentially could be a terrifying tool in the hands of the wrong person. The Bible says, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth trample it and break it in pieces. In other words, there is coming a day, a future event when a kingdom will rise up, a new empire which will consume all other empires of the past, and this kingdom will be ruled by one man. One man who will capture the hearts and minds of the nations. He will even capture the heart of Israel until he turns on them with the world power he has accumulated. I know exactly what you're thinking right now. Now, and the answer is, we don't know yet. There are many speculations of who this man is, and those of you who subscribe to my channel have already heard my speculations here, but ultimately, we will not know until we know. But there's one thing I'm pretty certain of, and it's this. In the last days, a new future, a new shining world will be promised to us, and there will be a great falling away, where men and women who are captivated by this new world and its laws, they will unite together against God just like the people did when they built the Tower of Babel. You already know that every man and woman craves power. You already know that every nation of the world wants to go down in history as great. And that is why Saudi Arabia's Kingdom Tower is to be expected, because everyone is just trying to build their own kingdom, and very few care about building Jesus Christ's kingdom. That is what the motive was for the Tower of Babel. The Bible says, and they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city, a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. You see, the people wanted to build something unforgettable. They wanted to leave a legacy behind. And today, nothing's changed. Today, people are working on big, huge projects. They're building everything. They're trying to create heaven on earth, as if this earth is all that we have. And yet the Bible warns us that one day, everything in this earth will be gone, will be thawed away, will be melted, will be destroyed. All those great big towers that have been built will one day collapse and everything that is invested into this life alone will vanish away. But the builders of the Tower of Babel had to learn this the hard way. They too wanted to build a new future, a new world, and they had one leader to help them achieve their goal. This man was called Nimrod, and his goal was to unite the people to come against God. In fact, the translation for the Tower of Babel in Babylonian literally means the gate of God or the gates of God. So they built what was likely a ziggurat kind of structure which had steps on it so they had the aim to be able to climb all the way up to heaven with their desire to try and dethrone God. It was an arrogant revolt against God. And just like today, modern day people, they can only unite over things that are against God and his laws. So the people of Babel declared their hatred against God by creating a united nation that spoke one language and refused to be scattered across the earth like the Lord had commanded them to do so. And you know exactly what happened next. God actually came down to them and he confused the languages. He made it so hard for them to understand what each other was saying that they had to halt the building project right there in their tracks. You see, God was not mocked and the people quickly migrated away and they started their own people groups. And that's why today we have a diverse world repopulated 
big, abounding in lots of different peoples and cultures, just like the Lord had always intended. But I know some of you don't get it. Some of you are saying, Joe, why is unity such a bad thing? Why would the Lord God want to stop unity from happening? Well, that will be the exact voice, the exact mantra of this one world ruler. He will bring everyone together and he will make world peace happen. But the problem is he will bring about unity in the things which God hates. But above all, remember this, God also wants unity, but it's got to be godly unity. And believe it or not, God also wants us all to speak one language, and that is the language of the cross. The Bible says, after these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. There is one who joins all tribes, all nations, all cultures together, not by some ideology, not by some sin, but through sacrifice and love. And again, without being too critical of Neom, the problem with Neom, if we're honest, is it won't benefit ordinary people. It certainly won't benefit the poor. Those who will benefit from Neom are those who are rich, who are affluent, who have a luxurious lifestyle already. And yet the message of the Bible is that Jesus came for both rich and poor, and he benefits all who will come to him in faith. Instead of men trying to climb up to heaven and reach God with their big skyscrapers and their huge structures, did you know that God climbed down to us? He came down from heaven. And may I add, he did not take a, an artificial hologram of himself. No, he came down with a real body, Jesus of Nazareth. And this man lived amongst us. He had a skin, a flesh like you and I. And when he came down, he did not come down in the same way as he came down on the Tower of Babel in judgment. No, he came down in love, not to condemn people, but to save them. And the Lord Jesus Christ, the most beautiful thing that this world has ever seen. What did the world do with him? They did not put him up on some technological structure. No, they nailed him to an old plain wooden cross. And there on the cross, the Lord suffered for my pride and your pride, for your lies and my lies. For all the times we've rebelled against God, for all the times we've come together as people and united over wrong things and committed wicked, shameful things, there the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified for our sins so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be reconciled with God, and he was the substitute for our sins. And the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven was full of splendor, full of riches. And yet what happened to him? He died the most humble death and was put in a lowly, dark tomb. But here's the wonderful thing. The Lord Jesus Christ left behind a legacy that no man can ever match. A legacy that forever goes on because he resurrected himself. He rose himself back from the dead. And if that fact is really true, if it is really true that God came down from heaven, lived amongst us, died on a cross, and then on the third day rose from the dead, that fact changes everything. And it doesn't matter whether the world is going to put one trillion dollars into profit. It doesn't matter whether a world is going to have all these massive, wonderful, big things that are going to happen. If it is true that Jesus Christ really rose from the dead, that changes everything. And this God-man Jesus commands you right now to take up your own cross and to follow him, to come to him in faith and be forgiven of your sins. And I'm asking you right now, have you done that? And if the answer is no, will you do that? But you say, that's interesting, Joe, but there are so many other religions in the world. Why is Jesus Christ the only one that I should follow? Why should I reject all other worldviews and follow after Christ? Well, did you know this? That there is actually a gate to God. And it's not the Tower of Babel, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ I said he is the only way. Listen to this. I am the door. This is Jesus speaking. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. You see, Jesus is the door to heaven. He is the only way to gain eternal life. 
All the other religions, all the other worldviews, their leaders are dead. And you can stand by their graves. But if you go to Jesus' grave, it's empty because death could not hold him down. That's one of the reasons why he's different. But I'll tell you another reason, because Jesus Christ, it's not a religion. You see, all the other religions of the world say, do this, follow this law, do that, and then perhaps you'll get to heaven. But Jesus Christ says, don't do anything. It's already been done. When I died on the cross and I said, it is finished, I really meant it. I completed it. I completed the sacrifice for your sin. And right now, if you come to me, I can wash you white than snow with my own blood. I can make you clean and wash away all of your sins and give you a fresh start. But there is one thing you should know about Jesus Christ, about this door, about this gate. The way is narrow. The Bible says there are two roads. There's a narrow way, a narrow gate, and very, very few enter through that. And then there's a broad way. And I want to know, are you one of these people who's got caught up in these big projects, who's fascinated by wealth, with luxury, with all the trappings of the world, and you're on that broad way that believes that this is all we have, that our heaven is here on this earth? Or are you one of the few who is willing to reject all of this, all of this life, and you enter through that narrow way, which is hard, which is difficult, but at the end, it leads to eternal life. And even better, it leads to the Lord Jesus Christ and eternity with him forever. Now, this is going to sound like a crazy diversion, but hear me out. I personally believe that the real Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia. And I'm not the only one who thinks like this. In fact, the Bible hints at it in Galatians chapter 4, verse 25. It says, For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Now, this massive project that Neom is about to undertake, the line, which stretches for 105 miles through the Arabian desert, it is believed that this will cross over into the territory of where we think the real Mount Sinai is. And this is quite a scary reality that some of our biblical archaeology could be lost forever and we'll never know what was there. But will the new Saudi mega project threaten this history? There's a city they call the Line, which would go from the coast all the way up into the mountains of Midian. And they just announced this next city, which is up in the mountains of Jebel Laws. This whole mountain range we believe it to be the mountain of God. And so you will find, as you're driving around the desert, these brand new roads that they're putting in and this whole camp set up for the workers. So it's a multi-year uh, project. We're just hoping that they don't, um, not just ruin the view, but destroy anything of biblical significance out there. So if that's caught your attention and you'd like to know about the real Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia, here's the evidence in this video.